Hello, good morning. Welcome to this week's episode of Learn with Lorna, episode number 161. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service, which has four archive centres in the Highlands of Scotland. We have one in uh, Inverness, one in Portree, one in Fort William, and one in Wick. And together, the four of those make up the Highland Archive Service. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there is no charge or subscription required uh, to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, as I say every week, we really are very grateful for that. And thank you to those of you who have done so. So welcome to episode number 161. Thank you for all your lovely comments last week. It was really nice to see where, how long people have been watching for and um, and where they are and what brought them to the series. It's, I can't tell you how much it's appreciated to to get that feedback from people. Um, I've seen your comment there, Anne. Yes, it's a beautiful sunny day here as well, but it's absolutely freezing. Um, so last week we looked at SWRIs, Women's Institutes, and that focus on the groups of women with uh, an eye on education and recreation. But this week we're looking at something completely different. The story of one man and one man's struggle against the all-powerful authority of the time, the Church of Scotland. We're looking at the story of Hugh Fraser, schoolmaster at Kirk Hill, and we're telling it through church records, so presbytery, Kirk session and synod records, through a deposited collection, D907, which is the papers of the old High Church, and also through some newspaper reports as well. It's a story that um, I stumbled across some years ago and was fascinated by, but this gave me the opportunity really to look further into it. And I'm sure there's still more to be found. There are so many twists and turns to this story. But first of all, for anyone who is not local, then just to locate ourselves, this story takes place in Kirkhill, which is a village and a parish in Invernessshire near Bewley. Um, the parish borders on Inverness and Bona, so quite close to Inverness. Hugh Fraser became the school teacher in Kirkhill in about 1811, and he had been born in around 1792. Just to, to put that into context, he would have been around 19 at the time. He was appointed as schoolmaster in, in 1811, as was usual at the time, by the presbytery. The presbytery being the church court above the Kirk Session level. So the Kirk Session being the local minister and elders uh, of one church. The presbytery being the kind of next area level up of several ministers and elders from different congregations. And so the presbytery were in charge of appointing schoolmasters because, of course, the church at the time had control of education. He was born and brought up, I think, in Kirkhill. He had certainly family there. And it seems that his first few years as teaching uh, in the parish were very, very positive. The presbytery seemed to be very pleased with him. There weren't many references in the records that I could find, things were just ticking over quite quietly. He was so successful at teaching, including the subjects around Latin and scripture, that, as we'll come to in a second, that he looked to progress into becoming a minister and training for the ministry. And that's relatively common at the time we see that with people progressing through teaching into the ministry. He finished the preliminary course of preparation that was prescribed for students of divinity. And then he presented himself to the presbytery to undergo trials for the church. They were satisfied with him doing so, but he didn't continue at that point. But he did continue to be successful as a teacher. And we know he was successful, because you're probably wondering why I'm able to say that if I've said we don't have many early references to him. But we know that because in 1824, the presbytery of Inverness, who, as I say, controlled education in the area, carried out inspections on all the schools within their bounds. So they uh, nominated people from with, within the presbytery, from different ministers and elders, to go and assess each school that they looked after. And David Fraser and Donald Fraser were appointed as a committee to go and visit and report on the schools of Kirkhill and Doors. 
And as you'll know, we're in Fraser country and I'm afraid of tripping over Frasers in this story. Um, so Donald Fraser and David Fraser visited Kirk Hill on the 16th of April, 1824. And we have a, a copy of the report that they produced within the papers of the Old High Church. So this is the report. At the parochial schoolhouse of Kirk Hill, the 16th day of April, 1824, Messrs David Fraser, Minister of Doors, and Donald Fraser, Minister of Kirk Hill, being a committee appointed by, for the purpose uh, of examining the parish school taught by Mr Hugh Fraser. The schoolmaster reports that the number of scholars at usually attending this school was about 90. There were 64 present on the day of the assessment. The several classes were called up in order, commencing with the youngest. These were found to be learning, so throughout the whole school, to be learning the spelling book, 21 of, 21 of whom 14 were boys and 7 girls, reading the New Testament, 10 of whom, uh, 10 of whom 8 were boys and 2 were girls, reading the Bible, 15 of whom 10 were boys and 5 girls, reading the school collection, 18 all boys. The committee had the great pleasure in observing the accuracy with which the classes went through their several exercises. The reading and spelling were excellent and the shorter catechism and several psalms were uh, repeated from memory with great correctness. Almost all the readers in the school read in the Gallic New Testament with great ease and exactness and those who were asked gave suitable answers to questions from the passages read. The youngest Latin class, seven in number, were reading Cordroy as an introduction. They acquitted themselves very well and gave gratifying proofs of their being well grounded in the peculiarities of this language. One young man read in Cornelius Nepos and gave great satisfaction. It was most gratifying to the committee to observe the order and method which pervaded the entire school and the complete subordination of the pupils. So it's a glowing report. They are delighted with the teacher, they're delighted with the teaching, the ability of the, the students, the discipline and subordination of the pupils, the order, the method, and so on. And incidentally, later that same day, they went to visit the other school in Kirkhill, which was run by the Society for, um, Educate, for Propagating Christian Knowledge. So not run by the Kirk Session, but run um, by another uh, external organisation. And they went to assess that as well, and they were much less impressed. They said that the proofs of proficiency were by no means as clear and gratifying as in the preceding school. So it seems like all was going very, very well for the young Hugh Fraser. About that time, he would have been around 32. And they are very complimentary about his ability uh, to teach. So that was 1824. It was about 1825 that things started to go wrong for Hugh, although I get the sense that that may have been building for some time. And I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this story because I just found it absolutely fascinating to delve into. Some complaints started to be raised and it seems that the minister in particular and one or two of the elders started to take a bit of issue with Hugh. He didn't raise his hat to the minister and he was reported to be overheard making negative or offensive comments about the minister. And there's little doubt from what I can read into it that he seems to have had, quite, Hugh Fraser seems to have had quite a fiery temper, but I'll leave you to judge the different personalities involved in this. But things really came to a head in July 1825 when this entry appears in the Kirk Session minutes. At Kirk Hill, the 8th of July, 1825, the session met. The moderator stated that this meeting was called in consequence of a conversation with the elder of the Kirk Hill district, who, being present in his place, would now state the substance of the conversation in a consequence of which the moderator had called this present meeting. You can't beat church records for uh, round and roundabout language. So basically, the elder's going to stand up and say why this meeting has been called. The elder for Kirk Hill, McCallum, then stated that there was in his district of the parish, and he believed in the parish generally, 
a very prevalent report that Jess Mackay, daughter of Widow Mackay, residing at the Port Lod Porter Lodge of Achnagairn, had been observed by several to have striking appearance of pregnancy about a month ago, that she had left the country clandestinely, so le left the area clan clandestinely, said to conceal her situation, and was now returned after several weeks' absence, apparently relieved of her burden. All this he thought it his duty to state to the session that they might act upon thereon as they should see cause. This being laid before the session, all the members present declared that it consisted with their knowledge that the story now stated was generally believed and spoken of throughout the parish. And the session therefore unanimously find that there is in this case, in this case a case of forma clamosa, and that it is their duty to investigate into the circumstances which have given to it, view to it as the laws of the church direct. So the Kirk Session are taking it upon themselves to investigate the fact that Jess Mackay has been reported A, to have been pregnant while not married, and B, that she has gone away for a few weeks and come back looking less pregnant but with no child. It goes on to say, but as common report, concealment of pregnancy is alleged and the child is a missing, the session resolved to take advice whether it may not be proper if reasonable grounds shall appear on investigation to bring this matter under the cognizance of the civil powers. So not content with investigating themselves, they're wondering if this needs to be taken to court. They agree then to meet on the 12th of July and it says that they will interrogate on that occasion Jess Mackay, her mother Margaret Chisholm, Margaret MacDonald, midwife in Achnagairn, who is said to have accused Jess of being pregnant before she left the area, and also Mary Mackenzie, wife to the coachman at Achnagairn, John Robertson, right at Kirkhill, and his wife, and John Barron, shopman to, um, to William Gunn, merchant at Kirkhill. So they say that they are going to come back, they're going to reconvene, and they're going to call all of these witnesses as to whether Jess was pregnant. And it's really um, hard for us to understand, I think, the level of intrusion that the church was able to to take up, you know, that they were able to say, why are you pregnant? We are going to call everyone to try and get evidence about this. I think that, um, yeah, I think that's quite hard for us to get our heads around. So, so far you might be wondering what's this got to do with Hugh, the schoolmaster, but the next entry shows why it became an issue for him. So, in, again in the Kirk session, at this stage of the business, so this is at their next meeting, Mr Hugh Fraser, schoolmaster of the parish, entered the church and addressed the session, stating in substance that his name had been connected by public report with the story raised against Jess Mackay, that finding that he had procured her return to the country and in proposing her doing so, had, so he is the one who's encouraged her to come back, but in doing so he had pledged himself that if she should return he would befriend and support her to the utmost. That under this pledge, as he found that the session had refused to allow a lawyer to be present on her part, he now wished the session to allow him, the schoolmaster, to be present at the examination uh, of this day to see that she received due justice. So quite interesting there that he's saying, yes, I've, I've been accused of um, having, you know, potentially fathering this child or potentially being involved with her in some way, but I've encouraged her to come back and speak to you, but I am here to make sure she gets justice. And I can't explain really how, I can't explain clearly enough how intrusive the next few months, weeks and years would be for Jess and for Hugh. And we see this right throughout the Kirk session. Kirk session and presbytery minutes include pages and pages and pages of evidence. Witnesses being interviewed about Jess Mackay's body, her body shape, um, whether she is has put on weight, whether she's more or less attractive than she was before. Uh, I'm just seeing your message there. We're looking in the 1820s, Jeannie. So they're asking all these witnesses to give an opinion about Jess Mackay's body shape, about her habits, about why she could have been absent for a few weeks, about her morals, about her standards of behaviour, about her connection to Hugh Fraser, the schoolmaster, 
and then an interrogation into Hugh Fraser's own character. And to add insult to injury, all of this evidence is then reproduced in the newspapers. And can you imagine the level of humiliation for that to be um, to be happening? It does seem incredible, I think. Here are some entries which illustrate a little bit what I mean and show the intense pressure, the intense control that the church, and remembering that the church at this point was always a group of men, um, the uh, immense level of control that they had. So here's an extract where they're interviewing Jess. She did actually appear, interrogated her, touching on the prevalent report of her pregnancy, whereupon she declared that she is entirely innocent of the charge of pregnancy alleged against her. Being further interrogated whether she was absent from home lately, declared that she was but cannot recollect the precise days she left home declares that she returned on Saturday last, of about a week, being the second day of the current month. Being interrogated, she declined telling where she was during her absence. So she's refusing, she's standing up to them. At the same time, offering as a, uh, as a reason that she had been advised not to tell. Being interrogated whether she would submit to be inspected by surgeons for the purpose of ascertaining whether she has recently been in a state of pregnancy she declared that she would not submit until any guilt had been proved against her. So that's her evidence. I'm not going to go undergo an assessment by surgeons until you can prove that you've got just cause to do that. And that she denies uh, being pregnant and denies, uh, refuses to say where she's been. Here's one of the witnesses. John Barron being uh, admonished solemnly by the moderator to declare the truth. Being interrogated, he declares that he has occasion often to see Jess Mackay coming into the shop at Kirk Hill, where he is a shopman, and that he observed that she was getting larger in size, but does not know from what cause, shortly before she left the area. That she commonly wore a grey cloak or mantle, and that he had occasion particularly to observe her in church, and that those sitting at the same table seat with her particularly had remarked how stout she was about the body, although he had no skill to judge what had caused that. Being asked if uh, if he saw Jess Mackay since her return home, declared that he did, and that he does not think her now as stout as she was when she went away. Um, so there, as I say, there are references there that, to her her body shape, her morals, her personality. There's one that I read that where they say um, they, they say that she is no longer what did they say that something like she is no longer as um, as attractive as she could be anymore. I've decided to go to to kind of summarise this to go for a newspaper summary of the case in eighteen twenty eight, because reading something from eighteen twenty eight in the press a shows how long this dragged on. B, how much it escalated as Hugh's frustration with the minister caused him to lose his temper. Uh, and that loss of temper, I think, turned, resulted in Hugh becoming the target of their anger. And also, just to illustrate how public this case was, it was resulted, it resulted in a libel case held in front of the church. And as I was reading this, I was speaking to to one of my colleagues yesterday and I said it almost feels to me, to, to, to be melodramatic, that this case arises around Jess, but because Hugh stands up, um, it's almost like the eye of Sauron turning onto him instead as the focus. So here's how the Inverness Courier described the situation as it came to a head in October 1828. Minister and heritors of the schoolmaster of Kirk versus the schoolmaster of Kirk, uh, Kirk Hill. This long depending case, which has occupied the attention of the Presbytery of Inverness for two years and a half, came for a decision yesterday at the meeting of the Presbytery held in the Gallic Church. Proceedings commenced at about 11 o'clock and did not terminate until six this morning. Latterly, the church was crowded to excess. The main charge brought against the schoolmaster was that of having carried on a criminal connection with a young woman named Jessie Mackay residing at Achnagairn, near the parochial schoolhouse of Kirkhill, 
and to this charge were added various alleged acts of improper and unbecoming behaviour evinced towards the minister and the heritors of this parish and displayed in the general conduct of the defendant. So you get the sense that in standing up to the session, and I may be reading something into this, so if you want to investigate it more, please do come and have a look. But I get the sense that Hugh has has stood up in um, in defence of Jess Mackay. He's let his temper get the better of him, and in his determination to defend her, has made things much worse for himself and has lashed out at the session. By the time the press were reporting this in 1828, it had gone way beyond the potential relationship he might have had with Jess. This was the summary of the case. The case of the minister and the editors versus the schoolmaster of Kirkhill, recently decided by the Presbytery of Inverness, having excited in this quarter the most intense interest, which is also spreading rapidly over the country, we beg in justice to both parties to lay before our readers, our readers a copious and faithful abstract of the evidence adduced before the Presbytery at its various sittings from April 1826 to August 1828 when the proof was closed. Through the courtesy of the agent for the complainers, we have been favoured with a literal transcript of the evidence, filling 769 folio pages. And although it was no easy task to compress the substance of this immense mass of various and conflicting testimony into the limits here assigned to it, we hope we have succeeded in preserving its more prominent points and bearings. It was, of course, impossible to tell all that all the witnesses said, but we have been careful to tell nothing that they did not say. For the sake of perspicuity, we subjoin a brief note of the charges in the libel. 1. Improper intercourse and intimacy with Jess Mackay. 2. Assisting her in absconding and in concealing her alleged pregnancy and in endeavouring to re repress the inquiry of the Kirk session. 3. Dereliction of duty and cruel treatment of scholars and instilling sentiments of disrespect and insubordination towards their superiors. Also teaching uh, obscene poems. 4. Raising scandals and prejudices against the minister. And 5 inputting corruption to the Kirk session and defaming its members. So, like I say, you can really see that it's it's escalated. The Edinburgh Observer, reporting on the trial, speculated that the whole case was a conspiracy to make Hugh Fraser lose his job as a teacher and to lose his reputation. And they say that they, they wonder if it stems from his having imprudently assisted his father and brothers to defeat certain of the heritors in one or more lawsuits and from his not regularly lifting his hat and otherwise showing a becoming deference to the minister. I wanted to read this extract for you because I thought this was absolutely... Uh, an absolutely extraordinary extract. This is Hugh Fraser's lawyer speaking at, as the case opened. I think this is very powerful. He says, the defender labours under various disadvantages. His accusers were the minister and the heritors of the parish of Kirkhill, from whose respectability a presumption would naturally arise that they would not enter upon a case of this kind without good grounds and that the defender must be a reckless and guilty man, instead of being, as was the fact, the victim of a compact of wealth and power, triumphing over innocence and debility. So he then says to the amassed people who are going to be judging this case, whatever influence the relative situations of the parties might have on the public mind, this defender now stands in a court of justice, which in this country is happily the sanctuary of freedom and truth where there should be no respect of persons and where the humblest individual is entitled to defend himself fearlessly and freely against whatever powers. He then says he hopes, therefore, that the court would endeavour to divest themselves of all preconceived notions and prejudices. And I think that is such a powerful statement to say you're in a court of law now and that means that you should have um, justice without prejudice. Hugh was found guilty in that case by five votes to four. And this is what the newspaper said. And again, this is very interesting. And I'm conscious I might run over today, but I didn't know what to miss out of this story. 
So this is a newspaper uh, uh, summarising the case and saying they have gone over all those 760 pages of evidence. And they say, we don't know this person, but this is what we think. He has received sentence of dismissal from his office as schoolmaster, and we have no doubt he will be dismissed accordingly. Of this man, we know nothing. We never even knew his name until we saw it in the report which we this day publish. And on that report alone, which on the authority of the highly respectable paper we copied it from, which was the Courier, um, we assume to be correct. We find that our arguments are in his favour. So he said, they're saying, we don't know anything about this man, but we've read everything and we think that he is telling the truth. We think he's the one that's in the right. The schoolmaster of Kirkhill may be a very worthless man or he may be a very good man, but he, but he be, may, we, but be what he may, we think he is very little obliged to his clerical judges. Nothing could be more futile and inconclusive than the evidence upon which they have condemned him. They admit that the proof is not sufficient, but the impression on their minds is that he is guilty, and by a bare majority they agree to cast him, beggared in purse and denuded of character, onto the wide world. One of these reverend judges, the very man who moved the resolution to eject him, so the minister who this fight is against, was in uh, the group of people who was able to uh, pass judgment. Even he could not say, um, he declared that some of the witnesses were guilty of perjury, that nothing had been advanced to convict him of indecent intercourse, and yet still his conduct seems to have been immoral and improper, that even if it had been otherwise, he, the divine, had no idea of making a whole parish unhappy for the sake of a single man. We, me we think this means, we presume, that it is better that one man should have to scrimp justice than, than that the whole area should be affronted by him being acquitted. So they are sort of saying, we get the feeling that they're, they would rather convict him than lose face at this stage. Such an argument may be admissible in an ecclesiastical court, but it is a special mercy for the poor, the friendless and the calumniated that it is not relevant in all our tribunals. It does go on to say, to the credit of the northern clergy, however, be it told, that this reverend pleader failed to carry all of his brethren with him. So the minister didn't have it all his own way. Four of them voted that the libel had been not proved and the question was decided by a single voice. Of the four, one of the four, Dr Rose of Inverness, though he stated he'd been condemned for years to listen to the scandalous stories propagated against the accused, insisted that he thought he had been harshly dealt with and that his punishment should not exceed a gentle admonition. It is on the speech of this humane and liberal-minded man and the vote of the three ministers who sided with him, conjoined with the general features of this case, that we ground our objection to the manner in which it has been settled. This schoolmaster may or may not be a worthless character, but there is no legal evidence that he should be declare, declared infamous, which has been virtually done by ousting from him from his charge. So he was told at the end of this libel case to leave his job, but he protested against this and he seems to somehow have been able to retain it because he does carry on in, in the role. But he took his complaint against this finding all the way up the church court system. What did happen, although he didn't lose his job, is that he was forbidden from taking communion. And again, perhaps it's hard for us today, for some of us today, to understand the huge implications of that for him and the impact that that had on him, someone who had been a schoolmaster or who was a schoolmaster and who had had aspirations to be in the ministry, to be forbidden from taking communion. In 1833, he gathered a series of names who would testify to his good character and we hold a copy of that in the collection. It's a huge long scroll with 150 signatures of the heads of households who have signed under this heading we, the undersigned heads of families residing in the parish of Kirkhill, do hereby certify that we have well known Mr Hugh Fraser, schoolmaster of this parish for the last 10 years, that during this period we never heard or knew of anything being alleged or insinuated prejudicial to his moral character, but the very reverse, except for his difference or dispute with the heritors, the minister and some of the elders of the parish, of which dispute we here give no opinion as we know nothing about it. 
but we consider that his moral character, with the exception of that above uh, stated incident, was always, both before and since that dispute, altogether unexceptionable and irreproachable, so far as we have ever heard or known, and that this was and still is our impression of his moral character. So quite interesting that he, large numbers of the community were willing to testify in his favour. So I mentioned that he was forbidden from taking communion and he was absolutely desperate to take communion again and he often went into church with this intention. Sometimes he was turned away, sometimes to keep the peace he was allowed to stay but not to partake in the elements. He petitioned the Kirk Session, the Presbytery and the Synod to reverse the decision that he was, should be allowed to take communion and to allow him to go back to training for the ministry. In a document that we hold, he begs to, and this is a quote, to be rescued from the state of suspense and distress in which I have been so long held. His lawyer, George Cameron, wrote numerous letters on his behalf, and we hold these in the, in the uh, High Church collection. Numerous letters in which he points out problems with Hugh Fraser's treatment and requests copies of things. So often he'll say, please can you send us a copy of the Kirk Session Minutes? Please can you send us a copy of the Presbytery Minute? Please can we have the evidence that you are building this case upon? He notes at one point, your court meetings, the, the church court meetings, have been held in secret, but technically as it's a court, the accused should be permitted to be present. So you're making decisions when we're not able to hear what you're saying and then minuting it and not giving us a copy of it. On one occasion, Hugh strode into Kirkhill Church and was again denied communion because he didn't have a token. So this is at the point where you would have to be issued with a communion token. He held up his Bible in church and he shouted that this Bible alone gave him the right to sit at the Lord's table. This state of affairs carried on for several years, with Hugh Fraser appealing to the Presbytery, the Synod, the General Assembly, all of whom backed the previous decisions. By the 10th of June 1838, Hugh seems to have been at the end of his tether and matters took another turn, leading to, the, to his fight with the Heritors becoming a matter for the Civil High Court. This is how it's described in the 1839 document entitled Criminal Libel, the Procurator Fiscal against Hugh Fraser for obstructing divine service. And this one comes from our Fraser Tytler collection because Fraser Tytler, William Fraser Tytler was the sheriff at the time. The said Hugh Fraser did on the 10th day of June 1838 or on one of the days of that month or the May preceding it or the July immediately following, so somewhere around then, within the parish church at Kirk Hill while the congregation were there assembled on the occasion of the dispensation of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, he did wickedly, willfully and unwarrantably intrude himself among the communicants of the said congregation there assembled and did take a seat among them at the communion table and having been requested by the Reverend Alexander Fraser, minister of the parish, then officiating in dispensing the sacrament to remove himself from the communion table at which he had seated himself and he having refused to retire, although repeatedly requested to do so, so the minister asked a couple of other people, particularly one of the elders who was also a JP, and said, could you help me in getting rid of Hugh Fraser? He says um, that Hugh Fraser would not, he would not leave. He publicly announced, this is the minister, publicly announced that Hugh Fraser would not be permitted to take communion or to partake in the elements of the Lord's Supper. The said Hugh Fraser then did, as the cup containing the wine was passed from one to another of the communicants, seated on the table opposite him, he did forcibly and indecently snatch at the communion cup and violently seize hold of it, and did partake or attempt to partake thereof. And this he did in opposition to the authority of the minister and against the remonstrances of the said elders and to the great distress and disquietude of the congregation. So. This has now escalated further. He has tried, and like I say, I don't want to put too much of an interpretation on it, but it seems to me like this is a man who's quite desperate at this point, um, that he's tried to seize the communion cup and be able to, to take communion. And so he found himself charged with breach of the peace, 
with profanity and with illegally disturbing the congregation. And again, in his fury, he was unguarded in his speech. And there are some really interesting documents which record Hugh's answers to his accusations and they would make some a really interesting research project. I'm looking at you, Rosemary, that would be a good project for you. Um, so all his answers to every time he's accused of a list of things, he writes back his replies to why he thinks the accusations are not accurate or not fair or not legal. In this one, he says that the case has been raised by certain members of the court, the church court, who are absolutely determined to have him excommunicated and deposed as schoolmaster. He says, the clear and avowed design of this court or certain members of thereof is revenge and the putting down and ultimately ruining of the appellant by a mere stretch of usurped power, a course pursued by them for the last 12 years. He noted that Alex Clark, the moderator, and Alex Fraser, the minister, had declared him a guilty sinner before the case had even taken place and openly tampered with other members of the court, encouraging them to a particular verdict. He then said that Alex Clark had selected all the people who would be involved in judging the case and he describes 12 years of bullying, cruelty, oppression and unchristian behaviour against him. Incidentally, there are others who did who did support him, like Dr Rose, who was mentioned in that newspaper report. And Hugh does reference them. He mentions the kindness that they have shown to him. And for one particular man, he writes to him and says, I know that this has been uh, difficult for you to support me. In the interests of fairness, I think I should continue to, I should note that they did continue to bring examples of his temper and of his lack of discipline. The matter went to court in October 1839 and was tried by the Inverness Circuit Court of Justiciary under a law from 300 years earlier. It was widely reported in the press. Hugh was found unanimously not guilty of breach of the peace and not guilty of profanity, but he was found guilty of disturbing the congregation. The judges who oversaw this case, Lord Medwin and Lord Mackenzie, said that as he had been found guilty of under that particular statute from 300 years ago of disturbing the congregation, they had no flexibility in the punishment that they had to administer and that all Hugh Fraser's movable goods had to be turned over to the Crown. But the judges also said, although there was no flexibility in the punishment they, they, had, to, they had to dispense if that was the verdict, they noted that they regretted that they didn't have any discretion. But Hugh Fraser was said to be quite pleased with the result because he'd been found not guilty in two of the charges and guilty in one. And that, as far as I know, is the end of the matter. Although, of course, I haven't carried on looking through more and more and more records, so there may be more. And of course, within a couple of years, the church was seen soon to go into a far bigger crisis with the disruption and the creation of the Free Church, which rocked Kirk Hill as it rocked other areas. Hugh Fraser continued to be the schoolmaster at Kirk Hill until 1850, when he took up a small holding with his wife, Jess Mackay. And his wife, Jess Mackay, when we looked up her, their marriage, uh, she is the daughter of a Margaret Chisholm. So I'm fairly confident it is the same Jess Mackay. Um, interestingly enough, through the uh, 1840s, 1850s, I found more glowing press reports which reference Hugh's well-known ability and success in teaching and note that he was well appreciated by all the parents in the parish. I found him then being interviewed in the 1850s. He's being asked for his opinion on church matters because there's an incoming new minister and as a notable member of the community, they have asked him among other people what they feel, what he feels about the new minister coming in. He died in 1864 at the age of 72. So make your own mind up. I, I don't know the truth of this case, but what I do think is quite clear is that you were a brave man at the time to be standing up to the authority of the day. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed seeing your comments coming in. I think it, it is a particularly interesting story, I think. Um, and yeah, I was glad to be able to delve a bit further into it. 
So I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing you next week. Next week I'm looking at the McGregor Papers, um, which are a couple of collections held in our Loch Aber Archive Centre. I'm now going to head out to give uh, a talk at Loch Ardell. So if you happen to be in Loch Ardell 6, uh, six 7, 8 Club, I'll see you in a couple of hours. Um, and then I will be with my colleagues tonight at the High Life Highland Staff Awards where we have received a nomination. So we'll send, uh, put a picture up and let you know how we get on at the Staff Awards tonight. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your time and your company. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. If you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. Thank you.